In this lecture, we're going to look at um, some more reactions under basic conditions. We're focusing on the fundamental reactions as opposed to sort of an onslaught of all the different possible variants. So kind of the fundamental key steps that one would need to have some experience with to understand a multitude of, of reactions under this category. So the topic in this lecture is going to be metal insertion um, or metal um, halogen, I'll put halogen in parentheses. So it's really metal insertion or metal exchange. And we've seen a little bit of this when we were looking at ambutyl lithium reactions, but the most classic example is formation of the Grignard reagent. So the Grignard reagent involves uh, making the Grignard reagent is very um, simple. It's almost the, the beauty of the reaction is its simplicity. If we have just a typical one-off reagent like bromocyclohexane, if you recall, what you do is you take the haloalkane, that, that alkane with the halogen, you add to it Mg0, and this is zero oxidation state uh, magnesium. And what happens is a process called oxidative addition to give rise to Mg fitting between the carbon and the bromine bond. So we call this an oxidative addition event. I didn't use those words in organic one, but we can see that we go from a zero oxidation state magnesium to a magnesium with an oxidation state of plus two. It's countered by a Br minus and now a carbon minus. Okay, so this is kind of a new process, oxidative addition, but it's very powerful and it really expands the opportunities that one can, um, uh, uh, opportunities for reactions that one can do with um, haloalkanes and that sort of thing. So let me just break it down a little bit. So an oxidative addition, a metal inserts itself between two co covalently bonded elements. Okay, now additionally, and that's the um, addition part of oxidative addition. I mean, it's the overall process, but you can see the addition, the metal has added itself to the covalently bonded system. Now it's called oxidative addition because the metal goes from something to something plus two. I'm showing zero to zero plus two, but we could go from plus two to plus four, we could go from plus one to plus three, we could go minus one to positive one, a lot of different um, options, negative two to zero, although those are a little bit um, more scarce. Okay, so um, a fairly popular one is to look at palladium zero plus H2. So we use this exact process to do what's called hydrogenation of alkenes, converting an alkene into an alkane. So we used palladium on carbon for that, but palladium on carbon is just palladium zero. Now what happens is, is that the covalently bonded system, which is H2, actually receives a palladium atom between it to make palladium plus two. And so I write that as two plus, it's a way of writing oxidation states without getting confused with charge, but not a big deal. You can write plus two if you want to. We're gonna look at that a lot more when we look at transition metal chemistry in the upcoming uh, weeks. But what I wanna focus on right now is lithium halogen exchange. Lithium halogen exchange. This is sort of a, um, in my words, a pseudo oxidative addition that is the more traditional oxidative addition events, typically those that involve transition metals like palladium um, undergo this reaction probably fundamentally a bit differently than what we see. But what we can do is we can take things like N-butyl lithium, which you can buy um, 
kind of scary to think about, but you can buy like barrels of N-butyl lithium. We talked about the hazards associated with that a couple of lectures ago. And what you can do is you can plop that lithium atom onto other atoms, or excuse me, other molecules that are halogenated. So a popular one is to take um, in a halo alkane, typically when X is Br or I, and you can exchange the lithium for the halogen, hence the name lithium halogen exchange. And we prefer to put that lithium on things with um, a more S character that or less P character. So in this case, we have an SP3 carbon and the lithium would rather be on a carbon that's SP2. You could do the same thing from SP2 to SP if you want to put it at the end of an alk alkyne. What happens here is the lithium and halogen just sort of sort of uh, swap places and you get now a um, phenyl lithium or an aromatic lithium in this case. So this is pretty useful because as I mentioned, organolithiums can be fairly nucleophilic. It's not super useful all the time with butyl. I haven't seen actually that many people that have used butyl lithium productively as a nucleophile. Like you often don't need a butyl chain and if you do, might be easier ways to get there. Um, but an aromatic ring, we see those all the time. And so introducing those from a methylated intermediate is actually quite useful. Now, a way of thinking about the mechanism, but the mechanism is still in dispute a little bit. is to sort of think about this reaction like a substitution event where we have lithium, you know, falling away as a plus and same with its bond, the carbon with a negative charge. And we let that interact with, in this case, the halogen atom. So it's going to add to the halogen and push the R group away as a sort of leaving group, it's a bit odd, I realize, making the new sp3 haloalkene in this case, plus R minus, which then adducts with lithium plus to give us R lithium. It's a way of thinking about the mechanism. I believe there's probably an open shell mechanism involved here. Um, that is a radical mechanism. So other mechanisms involve radical intermediates and maybe more likely. Okay. So um, we got metal uh, intermediates or hypervalent um, halogen atoms. So there's a few uh, different possibilities. Um, but this is a pretty useful reaction because you can start to do some really interesting uh, things. What I want to do is um, let, me, let me think about a the next uh, interesting reaction I want to describe. Let's do this one. Let's kind of pick up where we left off at the end of uh, the last lecture and make um, a benzene intermediate. So you can actually make benzenes using metal halogen exchange. Okay, so what we do here is we could have benzene with a halogen and some leaving group. And a pretty easy example would be dibromobenzene, if you think about it, Br, Br, sure. And if we add this to butyl lithium, we actually form benzene. Now, if we look at the mechanism, this looks very similar to the mechanism we saw on the last lecture, where the first thing that happens is metal halogen exchange, and I'm going to let the curly arrows go on this first step. And let's just say we observe lithiation at one of the bromine atoms. 
Well, that's equivalent to thinking about that carbon being an anion next to bromine. So we could just push that off and make a benzyne plus a Br minus. Now this is kind of, um, this is a pretty cute reaction, don't get me wrong, um, but uh, it's kind of troublesome because the butyl lithium is nucleophilic and could kind of swallow up the reaction. What I actually do in, in my lab is I exchange the leaving group with triflate and then exchange the halogen with iodide. By having the larger halide atom, we can actually use Grignard reagent. So I use a fairly sterically hindered Grin Grignard reagent. It has a TMS group on it um, and it's commercially available still. Mixing these two together allows us to form a metallated species by way of metal halogen exchange. I'm just gonna put MGX. I don't know if it's iodide or chlorine on there still. That's going to be ortho to the amazing leaving group, which is triflate. And we can just let the electrons come down and go over to make benzene. So that seems to work um, a little bit better, a little bit cleaner, can achieve some higher yields. Whereas the butyl lithium intermediate, um, or excuse me, the butyl lithium base that we use can actually um, uh, do reactions themselves because they're somewhat nucleophilic. So let me, let me take note of that. And then we'll talk about some ways that we can overcome that. So this is better than using butyl lithium because you avoid butyl nucleophile side reactions. Okay. There's a, there is another approach. Um, alternatively, um, you could uh, you could use two equivs of the organolithium. So by two equivs, that means sort of double the stoichiometric load. So if you're doing a metal halogen exchange and you had some sort of haloalkane, you had one millimole of it in your reaction, two equivalents would say you're adding two millimoles um, to the reaction. Okay, now why would you wanna do that? If, if this butyl um, lithium nucleophile that's supposed to serve as a lithiating agent is um, introducing some bad side reactions, why would you want to add more of it? Well, it turns out the second equivalent will destroy will um, destroy the butyl halide. Okay, so another issue with these butyl lithium um, reactions is that you form butyl bromide, which is uh, not great because it's a good electrophile. And so you have like, like you have this cross contamination of nucleophiles, they're too nucleophilic, and then side, re side products that are too electrophilic. And so what you can do is you can mix RBR plus, and we typically use T-butyl lithium if we're concerned about this, to form R lithium plus T-butyl bromide. And then what T-butyl bromide does is it does a subsequent reaction with the T-butyl lithium second equivalent to destroy itself. And the products are actually interestingly enough, an alkene that's pretty inert, and then T-butane, which is very inert, plus lithium bromide. Now let's look at an example of that. T-butyl lithium is, is useful for a lot of reasons. If I assume that I've got RLI, the byproduct after T-butyl lithium exchanges its lithium is T-butyl halide. Now what I'm saying is this is going to go do chemistry the RLI will. But we have 
more of this t-butyl lithium around. Now what I'm going to do is consider using the lone pair of electrons and they're going to actually grab a hydrogen and induce an E2 elimination, like what we talked about last time on the t-butyl bromide side product or byproduct, I guess. It's not a side product because it's actually a product of the primary reaction, but it's not the one we care about. So it's a byproduct. All right, when I do that, the t-butyl lithium has grabbed a proton and then the t-butyl bromide has made an alkene and those are my products. So that's one approach is you could switch to t-butyl lithium. First of all, you make t-butyl bromide, which is, has lower electrophilicity. So already this is set up for success because you don't have side reactions from that going and reacting with some nucleophile that's present. Um, additionally, it will engage some, um, it can be easily destroyed if you're worried about that at all by reacting with excess t-butyl lithium to make inert byproducts. Okay, what I think I'll do is looking at the notes, we've got some more things that we could do with lithium, metal lithium exchanges, but what I want to do is save those um, for the lecture on alpha eliminations, which comes next. So we'll stop here.